right, so let me first uh, thank very much uh, Frank and, and Jeremy and Tomas for the invitation to speak at this conference, but also to the other organizers for um, uh, organizing such a great program, and it's, it's great to be here. So um, what I'm going to talk about is kind of um, a little bit uh, the plan is, uh, and I apologize to some of you who, who have heard me at least once, and I, I can see Alex there. Uh, so, like uh, 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 Mikhail said, feel free to prove a lemma while, while I speak so on, on your own work. So anyway, so what I would like to do is because of the mixed audience is to first maybe um, review a little bit um, some of the work of Burgen, which is in the background of all of this, and then sort of talk about some recent work uh, with Giliola Stavilani uh, for the cubic um, equation in 2D and the quintic uh, focusing in 1D. And, uh, and then sort of like talk about some uh, w more, more recent work, which we're still uh, writing, uh, with um, Sakhar Hani and Jonathan Mattingly, Luke Reveille and Giliola. And um, maybe perhaps between one and two and three, um, I want you to think about like, um, it's kind of like talking about sort of, uh, uh, in the first two is like the notion of Gibbs measures, which is this sort of like a equilibrium state. Come in, and while the second part is about uh, sort of like the the, the non-equilibrium um, uh, uh, states. So, oh, sorry, I have to use this. Okay, so let me quickly. So, so, so I'm going to talk about the, the Schrodinger equation, and just for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to talk most of the time um, about the the periodic case, and I'm going to talk about the square torus, not the the rational one. And sort of for the purpose of this talk, every time that I talk about critical, or supercritical, or, or, sub, or subcritical, I always mean relative to scaling. And so as everybody knows here, because uh, uh, we have people here who have done that, that, that work, there has been a lot of progress um, uh, uh, in studying these equations, and most of it has uh, uh, been sort of a, a deterministic aspects of the, of the phenomena. Uh, but there are still some questions that remain. There's essentially like, you know, supercritical case, which even in the defocusing case, people don't know if you have blow up. And, but also there are gaps uh, in the, in the well-posedness theory, um, as we will see. So here is just quickly some reviews like of some of the work that you all know on RD. And so this is for subcritical regimes. Um, here, the work of Burgen, the work of Coriander, Kilis, Tavilian, and Taco Catao. And then we know sort of for critical equations, I mean, and I'm not putting all, all, all names, but there has been a, a lot of like fantastic work and also some conditional results at sort of intercritical. And so, uh, and supercritical, as I said, there is um, not much, uh, there's not nothing known really in, in the defocusing case. Okay, so uh, on the periodic case, though, the situation is uh, much more limited and the results are fewer. And there's even, no, even a problem at the local well posedness theory, right? So, so, so Burgen proved, like in 93, that actually the dispersion in the periodic is indeed weaker. And so, for example, in 1D, the L6 or the L4 in 2D actually do have epsilon derivatives. This is actually, he, he constructed the examples. And so what that means is that in the local well posedness theory, you cannot, although this uh, 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 the equation, for example, the cubic in 2D or the quintic in 1D are L2 critical, you cannot close them. There is no local theory at the level of L2. That's open, okay? This is bigger than zero. Uh, there are no results in L2, local. Okay, and so in the same paper, the subcritical regime, so uh, Burgen uh, um, sort of proved as I said, the, the local well posedness. These are just some examples. And of course, you have uh, global uh, uh, at the energy level. Okay, so how about global? Well, global, you have uh, the work for, so there were work for, for small data, of Hertha Selkov Tataru. Uh, and then the sort of the, the, the breakthrough uh, work, the first sort of like global, da large data global of uh, Jonas Composader, uh, who actually did uh, the large data for the quintic defocusing in 3D. Um, a student of mine did, after the breakthrough actually of Burgen de Meter, of the Strichers, he did, um, that's part of his thesis, he did the cubic defocusing uh, in a less in 4D. And uh, as I said, there was a small data uh, we saw before. And uh, maybe I should mention here that uh, there's work of Philippe and Design, which they have also a different proof of the small data and new proofs for the irrational case. But as I said, I'm going to focus on the rational case, and the reason is because in the non-deterministic setting, you still rely heavily on analytic number theory, and so we don't know um, still how to treat uh, many of the things uh, in the rational case. 
So the point is that, as I said, in the L2 level, there is not, this is not even no. So the, 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 the point of view that you want to take is that then maybe what you should do is you should study these uh, equations from a non-deterministic point of view. And uh, this brings us uh, uh, to uh, uh, Burgen, which is the starting point in 1996, where he studied long time dynamics for periodic equations in the almost sure sense. Uh, and show that uh, you have actually global well poseness on a set of uh, data of full Gibbs measure. So the Gibbs measures for uh, NLS uh, uh, had been constructed, say for example, for the uh, cubic NLS in uh, uh, 1D, in 2D, and 3D defocusing, had been constructed by Glim Jaffe in the context of uh, uh, quantum field theory, like the phi 4 model or the Allen, stochastic Allen Kahn. And then in the context of Hamiltonian systems by uh, Lewis, Ross, and Speer, who also treated the focusing case in one dimension. Okay, and here you have, if you don't, if you don't know, that just, just invariance means that you have this measure that if you take a set of initial data, you flow it, it preserves uh, the measure. And so, uh, and so why is it that it works? I mean, because usually what happens is uh, when you are sitting on the, and I'll show you in a minute, when you are sitting in the, in the statistical ensemble or in the support of the measure, you are at a regularity which is very rough. And there are no conserved quantities at that level. So why is it that you can get global? Okay? So the point is that assuming that you have a local well poseness and it doesn't have to be deterministic, it could be non-deterministic, then the invariance of the measure, what it does is acts as a conserved quantity that allows you to, uh, to continue the result from local to global at a level of regularity where there are no conserved quantities. So that's, that's, that's the key. Okay? And the virtue of, this, of doing this is that somehow it captures uh, generic behavior. And I'll say something more in a minute about that. And so now this, yes, I, I, I will explain a little. So, so oh, oh, an idea of what, what do I mean? And so, um, um, I mean generic in the sense of probability, that's what I mean. Okay, but I'll, I'll, I'll uh, you know, infinite dimensions is a big place, but you know, all right. So, um, so actually there are some, uh, uh, of course, limitations and challenges. One is actually for dispersive PDEs, the actual constructions of, this, of these measures. Uh, they are not that easy. Uh, They're easy to construct if you are on uh, um, finite measure, bounded domains, if you're in infinite measure or infinite volume, uh, there are some um, uh, problems. Um, uh, if, the, if the PDE is not Hamiltonian, it's not always clear how to do it. And as I said, in 2D and 3D, in the defocusing, uh, you actually, uh, you cannot construct it directly. It was proved uh, that actually what you have to do is you have to renormalize the nonlinearity and uh, remove some sort of like uh, 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 divergences, or some infinities in order for the measure to make sense. That was known. Uh, in the focusing case for 2D, uh, Bridges and Slate said that there was no Gibbs measure. The measure is not available in higher dimensions, like four. And even in 3D, if instead of cubic you are quintic, then it's also known that if you try to do the same renormalization procedure, you either go to something trivial or to the Gaussian measure, so there are no Gibbs measures either. Okay, and uh, for example, if you take something like the defocusing quintic in 2D or the cubic in 3D, for which there is a measure, the problem, and I'm going to show you why in a minute, is that in order to prove the invariance, uh, you, you, you of course have to have a, a global flow and you can have actually a, a weak solution. But if you want to show the global well poseness, then you're going to sit, as you go high in dimensions, you're going to sit in rougher and rougher spaces. And it's actually not clear how to, to, to do this. Okay, this is challenging and, um, um, but I, you know, okay. So, so the, 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 the defocusing quintic into the might be within reach uh, thanks to the, sort of the new, new techniques from some sort of like the, the para control distributions of Gubinelli or regularity structures, but this is a little bit too soon to talk about that. Okay, so quickly, how is this measure defined? Because I'm going to be this, uh, uh, needing this, so of course you think of your equation as an infinite dimensional uh, Hamiltonian system on the Fourier coefficients. And let's say one dimension, let's take just one dimension, P, the less or equal than phi, will level sort of spear, said, well, you know, you, you can construct this measure that formally looks like this. Okay, so this is like Lebeck measure, this is Hamiltonian, and this is a measure. Now, if you look at this, this is total nonsense because every, there are three, three terms here, the, the Lebeck measure and the kinetic and the potential energy, and every single factor is infinity. So this makes no sense. 
uh, but it's suggestive of what is it that you, 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 you want to do, okay? So, so you cannot define the, even the Lebesgue measure. Um, but what you do is you, you take, a, you construct it using a Gaussian measure as a reference measure, and then you construct the uh, Gibbs measure as a weighted uh, measure uh, in two steps. So, so, so the Gaussian measure uh, on some sort of like Hiller space, whatever you wish, you construct it as the weak limit of finite dimensional measure. So here you see this is the kinetic part of your, uh, of your Hamiltonian, and this is the uh, Lebesgue measure, which if you're Hamiltonian, then Liouville's theorem tells you that it's volume preserving. And uh, then this rho n in the is, is, an in is, is sort of like you can view it as an induced probability measure under this map, okay? So where these are just from now on, these are always uh, IID complex uh, Gaussian random variables, take them with mean zero. And so uh, uh, the point now, the most important point now, is that you want to understand the Gaussian measure rho as a weak limit of these finite dimension approximations. And it's easy to see that they are additive, but they are not countably additive. And so the point is that if you want them to be countably additive, and there is a theorem, a trace theorem, that tells you when they are countably additive, then the point is that uh, on HS, they are countably additive only if S is less than a half, okay? Uh, but not in S big or equal than a half. Uh, they are in 2D, they are countably additive if you are below L2, uh, with probability zero uh, more. In 3, if you are below minus a half, probability zero if you're above. Okay, so what that means is that if I want to, to, to this, is, this is exactly what guides you, what is the support of the measure, and where is the data going to live? That's the regularity of the data you're going to take. So in 1D, if you're looking at, uh, uh, um, the, the Gibbs measure, you have to be uh, sort of uh, in H a half minus. If you are in, uh, uh, in 2D, you have to be just below L2 and so on. So you see, as you go high in dimensions, you get very, very rough. Uh, and so uh, once you, you, you do this, then you know that this Gaussian measure is just the law for this uh, random variable. And so these are the typical elements in the support of the measure. This, this is how they look, okay? And so this is a function almost surely in 1D and the distribution in higher D and you have this, this tail estimate. So as I said before, once you have constructed the Gaussian measure, then the Gibbs measure is just a, a, a weighted measure where, where sort of this is the nonlinear part of the, of the Hamiltonian. This is the uh, renormalization. And what you want is this to be sort of the, the Radon-Nicodin derivative. Uh, you want this to be in L1 relative to, to, to rho. And so if you are in the focusing case, uh, you have nothing for free because you still, in order to, be, to do the renormalization for this to be a probability measure, you have to put uh, the L2 cutoff, okay? So the same cutoff that you see in the deterministic case comes here. And actually, it's a nice exercise to see which, be, which constant is, is uh, uh, larger. And actually, this one is smaller. So, so you don't win anything. But anyway, uh, uh, so if, if, if the power is less than five, uh, you just need some cutoff. And if the power is five, which is the critical, uh, mass critical, then it has to be sufficiently small. All right, so what is that Burgen did? It's like Burgen proving 1D. This is his result. So I just, I'm just stating it because I want you to get used to how he reads is that you take the equation with that data, which is the data in the support of the measure, and then what does it mean to prove almost sure? It means that you can find a set in here. If you're focusing, uh, you have to condition everything to have a small L2 uh, of measure one, of the, of the Gibbs measure one, such that for any such data, the initial value problem can be continued globally, okay? And then uh, you also prove that this measure is also invariant. Okay, so why is this important? Well, let's recall for a second, deterministically you have local if S is strictly bigger than zero, and global if you are in H1, and, uh, and that's it. And so what the invariance measure gives you, as I said before, is a global result in H half minus, where there is nothing, there is no conserved quantity, so how are you going to get it? But that's, that's what the, the measure does for you. And so how does he prove this? Let me just quickly go through this because we are going to need it. It's like what, what you have to do is you have to approximate the equation uh, by a finite dimensional approximation. And, um, and, and actually the crucial fact, because what I want to bring home here is, is how do you use the invariance of the measure? And what is important, which is a little bit of a, of a, of a confusion, is that what you, what you really use is the invariance of the finite dimensional measure. 
not the, not the invariance of the infinite. The variance of the infinite some come, comes in parallel to the, to the global well poseness at the end. So, so why is it that the finite dimensional measure is, is, is invariant? Well, because uh, for this equation, when you take these things, you stay Hamiltonian. So this stays Hamiltonian, which is not always true when you take an equation and in order to prove a local result, you have to gauge. I mean, what happens is that you might stay Hamiltonian, but the problem is that you don't know how it looks, and this is actually a, a very delicate point. Uh, what happens with uh, Gaussian measures, so measures under sort of these uh, non-canonical uh, transformations. And then, as I said before, Liouville's theorem then tells you that because you stay Hamiltonian, this is volume preserving, this is conserved, so this is a, a conserved, this, is, this measure is, uh, uh, is invariant. And now what you do is you use the invariance of the finite dimensional measure to continue, so you know by the, by the local theory, you have a deterministic local theory for this, local, and so now you use the invariance of this to continue the solution to the finite dimensional approximation to a global one in time, provided that you, have, you are on a set of good data. So what that means is that in this process, you have to select uh, a set of, of omegas with probability one that uh, tell you that you're still, um, that you can continue, that you can do this process. And so once you have this, then how do you continue you? There is this approximation lemma that tells you that once you have the finite dimensional uh, reach time t, you take the u that you know that is local, and you walk the u in an iterative st uh, st uh, uh, method side by side with the un. And this is not a trivial problem because what happens is that uh, you see, after the initial the local time of existence, you somehow these two can become really far apart, okay? And you have no a priori bound on u. So this is a non-trivial lemma, so what you have to do is you have to take, as a stepping stone, an intermediate system, which is the infinite dimensional uh, equation with uh, uh, projected uh, data. And then what you do is you, you, you use that as a stepping stone and you compare uh, u to u prime and then u prime to u n step by step and then that's that's how you do it and so once you have that now you have now the the sort of the global u and sort of the icing in the cake is that you get uh, the um, you prove that you have this converges to, to, to mu and you, pr you get the invariance of mu uh, but it's really the invariance of, of, of mu n Okay, so how about 2D, what the Burgen did in 2D, and here is where, where it becomes interesting, uh, 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 maybe what I want to say, is that, uh, so in 2D he considered now the cubic, which is a still L2 critical, but now, as I said before, the Gibbs measure, which was known to exist, uh, is, uh, needs some sort of like renormalization in order to exist, okay? And you can actually see this renormalization also uh, in trying to prove this theorem, uh, because it's actually the same thing you need to remove uh, to deal uh, with resonances. And so what you do is you have to treat what is called the weak order uh, nonlinearity. So you have to subtract this term uh, from the cubic. And then he proved exactly uh, the same theorem that then your globally will pose uh, below L2 and uh, the associated measure is uh, invariant. So here uh, now this is the point that in the, in the kinetic, in the potential energy this is unbounded almost surely, so you have to sort of weak order and uh, so you renormalize the finite dimensional approximation and, uh, and that removes this term. And what I would like to say is that actually this is the first result ever that is global and is supercritical, okay? So in the, in the dispersive community this is the first result uh, uh, that is supercritical and global. So supercritical in the sense of L2, you mean? Yeah, scaling. Every time, as I said, every time I talk about critical, supercritical is relative to scaling. Okay, and so and so something nice that is actually uh, just an observation is that you see that the measure sort of always charges open sets with positive measure. So if you prove using this argument, if you can prove that such a result with, with probability with measure one, then what that tells you is that you cannot have blow up blow up in that topology. Uh, that is, a st you can have blow up, but you, you, it cannot be stable in that topology, okay? So that's actually uh, um, something nice, okay? Because, you know, okay, you can still have this defocusing, you don't know if you have blow up, but it cannot be stable. Okay, so that tells you that, that's kind of like this. Okay, so now the additional difficulty here is that Burgen did not have a local well-postness in place as he did in 1D. 
Okay? So he cannot even start the argument that I just described a minute ago. Because there is no local, there is no deterministic local well poseness before below L2, it's supercritical. So what he says is he says, well, look, I mean, I just want to prove an almost sure global result. So why do I need a deterministic local? It's enough to prove that I have a local well poseness for data that is in the support of the measure. In other words, all I need is a probabilistic. Uh, uh, local well poseness result. And so if you look at this paper from 96, which is a very long paper, it's like 56 pages, like, you know, 50 of those are just to prove the probabilistic local well poseness. Okay, so that's, 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 the, that's the heart of the matter in that paper, and the rest just follows uh, uh, the same uh, as before. So that's what I said there. Okay, and this is what I said a minute ago. So this brings us to this notion of saying, OK, so now forget about for a moment about the Gibbs measure and forget a moment about uh, global. Let's think about uh, just the local world poseness. And so what, what Burgen is saying essentially is that if you, if, you, if, you give, if you take data and you randomize the data, then you're always going to be able to improve your local theory. Okay, so that's the, the takeaway. Okay, and this is actually not a foreign idea for, for, for us and for, for anybody, but, but especially for harmonic analysts, because this is exactly what, 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 what we know and we use all the time. Uh, uh, when you prove little Paley inequalities, for example, uh, that sort of random series enjoy better LP, LP estimates. And so this randomization doesn't uh, improve the regularity, what it does is improves the, the LP, the, the integrability. But once you have that, then you use that in turn to uh, get better estimates that you would otherwise uh, deterministically. And so what is his, his strategy to, to prove this? And this is actually the same strategy that, I don't know if at the same time, but, but similar time, this is the same strategy that what is used, was used by the Pratt and the Bush uh, for, the, for the stochastic uh, Alan Kono for the FI4 model. And they were using exactly the same idea. What's the idea? The idea is that now you look solutions of a particular form. So what you'd say is you say, well, you randomize the data. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to look for solutions that look like the linear evolution of the random data plus some other uh, w. And instead of solving for u, you solve for the difference equation. Okay? And so as a consequence of this, and so what he can prove is that if you solve for this difference equation, now you solve here in a smoother space that you start. Okay, so you solve for a fixed, you know, whatever you want to do, but you're going to find the W in a smoother regularity than uh, the uh, initial data. And so as a consequence, he proves almost surely in omega that the nonlinear part always is smoother than the linear part. Okay, this is in his 96, 94, uh, 96 paper actually. Now, um, an important remark here is that by doing this, it's not that you're just saying that if you randomize, you bring the problem from being like supercritical to being subcritical. That's not true. I mean, what it is is that you have a problem where the nonlinearity is sort of hybrid, right? I mean, you have supercritical terms which are random, and you have sort of like uh, Ws which you treat deterministically, which are really uh, maybe uh, uh, smoother or subcritical. But you have to, but you have to treat uh, uh, all interactions, random, random, deterministic, deterministic, random, deterministic. And so one of the things that you need in place before you even start this thing is because you have to deal with the deterministic, deterministic at a smoother space, you actually have to have in place a deterministic local well poseness uh, in a smoother uh, space to start, at least in this approach. All right, so uh, let me just quickly tell you why it works or how it works. Uh, so, uh, 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 so everybody, I'm sure here, just stated, but everybody knows sort of the typical uh, large deviation estimates. So think of k here as being how many, uh, the, the, how many uh, random terms you are dealing with in your nonlinearity, whatever that is. And so here you have just a sort of a linear combination of the random variables. So a large deviation tells you that you know in omega. Uh, sort of the, the, the LP norm is, is controlled by uh, the L2 norm. And so what's the point of this? The point of this is that then uh, uh, by Chebyshev, the set where the absolute value of this function is bigger than lambda is uh, uh, decays exponentially. So now take any, any delta and take lambda here to be delta to the minus k over 2 times the L2 norm and put it here. And so what that tells you is that there exists a set, okay, which is the complement of this. So this omega is the complement of this. So the probability of the complement of omega is the probability of this, which if you put this number here gives you that. That tells you that if you're outside that set, right? So if you're outside this set, so that means if you're here, 
then you can replace the absolute value of this by the L2 norm, square. And that's fundamental, so let me show you why. Okay, that's the key. So what's why? So let's do an example. Suppose that you have data that looks like this. Okay, this is what Burgen will have if you are in two dimensions just below L2, it will look like this. Okay, and uh, in, in doing your, your random random interactions, what you have to do is you have to estimate things of this form. Okay, where this is just uh, the set of N1, N2, N3, each of them in Z2, such that uh, uh, they behave like this. Now, what the weak ordering does for you, which is, the, 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 which is actually very interesting because it's a different way of understanding resonances, is that it tells you that N1 and N3, these two, are never N2, which means that you never lose the independence of the random variables. So every time that N1 is N2, this becomes an absolute value square, you lose the independence. So the weak ordering, what it does, uh, uh, which is the same as the, 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 the resonance, it tells you that this stays, you, you always have independence, okay? And so now if you just were to do Cauchy-Schwartz here, if you want to estimate the absolute value of this, oh, sorry, the L2 norm of this, and you look at this, and you simply were to, so you sum in N and in M because I'm doing L2, and you simply do Cauchy-Schwartz, then you pick up, you lose, because you pick up the cardinality of that set. You pick up the cardinality of this set, which is big, okay? It's big, these are integers, you're counting lattice points on spheres or intersections of spheres or whatever. And, uh, 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 and, and then you lose, okay? And what that loss means that you cannot lose derivatives, you cannot close. And so what the large deviation estimate tells you is that you are replacing, as I said a minute ago, modulo a set of omegas, you can replace the absolute value with the L2. And so what you are looking up is at this, without that. And that's enough to close, okay? So that's how it works. I mean, that's, that's how it works in the old randoms, okay? Now, um, I want to say that something, just because Sergio is here, <laughs> I want to say quickly, that actually, uh, well, maybe I'll say it in a minute. Okay, let me, let me actually move a couple of transparencies. So, 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 so the takeaway from here is that the randomization, uh, uh, what it does, is actually allows you to improve the local world poseness theory, and you should view the randomization as a separate issue from the invariance of the measure. Uh, once you have improved your local uh, world poseness, the question is how do you go to global, and then, uh, it depends which equation you have, which regime you are. Uh, if you have a measure or you don't have a measure, uh, you can actually uh, do a variety of things or you may not be able to do anything, at least with, with current technologies. At least nothing that is conditional. I mean, one thing that I should say here, maybe going back, is that one problem that you have is that, you see, even if you, if you have conserved quantities or even if you have conserved quantities for you, in the way that you study these problems, when you study the difference equations, you have no conserved quantity. I mean, you lose, W doesn't satisfy any, any, anything. So uh, it's, a bit, it's a bit problematic. Um, okay, so uh, as I said, then, then how do you pass? So separate the two issues. Randomization improves local, and then if you have a measure, then you can go from local to global. If you don't have a measure, maybe you can do energy estimates, or you can do something else, depending on the regime, or you are still, you, you may be still working on it uh, because you have nothing. And as I said, there was a, uh, uh, this has been a lot of work after Burgen. Um, so nothing happened between Burgen's work and sort of around 2007. And there was a lot of activity. I'm, I'm not being uh, comprehensive here. There's a lot of people that have worked for a lot of equations and not just uh, dispersive, also sort of like on, on fluids equations. And, and maybe because it's just searches just here, <laughs> I wasn't going to say anything because it's kind of like this is actually uh, part of a long-term project. But you know, in this in this paper that uh, we sort of consider sort of a, a nonlinear wave equation with uh, the the Kleinman Macadam null forms the QIJs, and actually uh, this we are interested in this question for a, for in this equation for a geometric purpose and for trying to understand these methods beyond. Uh, the, this regime in which what you do is you, you look around the linear evolution. We want to look around uh, uh, special solutions and, this, and these geometric equations have like a sort of ground state. So we are interested in, in trying to understand how to, to sort of under, how, how to propagate a little bit better, how to understand the transport of the, of the randomization. And, uh, but, but what I want to say is that, you know, it's, it's actually, it's, it's a beautiful recast of these null forms that actually you can, they're exactly, I mean, they're like a gift that keep on giving because they are exactly what you need when you have quadratic uh, derivatives uh, to preserve 
the uh, independence that I showed you before. So I told you that if you have random random interactions, you have to do something like the weak ordering to make sure that you you you, you keep independent the, the the random variables. And then and the and what the null form does is exactly Darwin normalization in the probabilistic context. And so so it's actually uh, quite interesting. And so let me quickly uh, talk about this. Um, this work. So this is actually two, two things in which, uh, two results which are still at the subcritical regime, but the reason why we are interested in this is because they are actually closing an important gap uh, in the subcritical uh, theory between the deterministic uh, theory uh, and, the, and the almost sure uh, global well posing. So one is in 2D, you take the cubic defocusing equation, and as I said a minute ago, um, so what we're going to prove was that if you are below L2, you have almost sure global. And uh, for, the, uh, look, for the global deterministic, using the I method, the best result known, uh, which I have a picture here, is above two thirds. Okay? And so we're going to prove it here. And if you are here, you have global. Uh, but uh, as I will explain in a minute, if you have a global web process that is a probabilistic, you cannot use just the deterministic propagation of regularity methods to, to, to fill in this gap. And so we were interested in understanding how to get global uh, in this range. And for the 1D, which is focusing, you have the same problem, um, in which there is a still a gap between, uh, so that the almost sure uh, global is just below a half. And uh, then, uh, of course, you have uh, in the focusing, you have uh, above H1. In the defocusing, you have above 4 ninths, but in the focusing uh, you have nothing and we also wanted to close that gap. And both of the results follow from a method that we, we like to call uh, propagation, uh, probabilistic propagation of regularity. So, so let me put this in here because this is, this is what I just, uh, I just said. Uh, this is, so let me just talk about the 2D. Why is this not trivial? The result is not trivial because if I give you data which is smoother than the, the random data that is sitting in H minus epsilon, that data is with probability zero, I told you, with probability zero is in the support of the measure. So I cannot just take la a smoother data, larger decay, and use Burgen. It doesn't, it, you have nothing, okay? So, 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 so you usually, you see, when you prove these results, I mean, this is what is it that you do. Having in dispersive PD, having more regularity never helps you. Usually what you do is you say, well, you need a conserved quantity to prove something global. You prove it at the level in which you have a conserved quantity. And then you use propagation of regularity to get the smoother solutions. And here that doesn't work, okay? And so uh, what we do instead is we sort of, the key idea is that what we want to do is we want to decompose the data into, into, into a term that is close to the support of, and I'm going to be made that precise, close to the support of the measure. And the rougher, uh, in the rougher topology, in the rougher topology that where we are, uh, so, so for example in 2D we want to do it for S bigger than zero, so uh, the rougher topology will be the H minus epsilon. And then a smoother reminder. And the question is how to do this so that things work. And then we want to do sort of like a, a sort of a, a perturbation argument. Uh, uh, to conclude, okay, and and the, and the and the argument that I'm going to present here is is actually we do it in these two cases, but it's very general. So every time that you have proved a result uh, that is almost sure using a measure, and uh, and and there is a gap above you, you can use it. So so every time that you have a measure, you, you can use this every single time. So let me just give you this example. So this is the statement of a theorem. Sorry for it. I have to state something. So u alpha just means it's just to remind you that uh, the data that I'm taking has this form, okay? So this alpha means that this is the data. So you see when alpha is zero, you are in H minus epsilon, and this is with probability zero in the support of the measure. So U alpha just means that uh, that's the data, and you solve the, the cubic uh, equation. And I'm above L2, so I don't, even if you normalize or renormalize, you're above L2, so you can always put the, the weak ordering, which is finite now, into the linear term. So, so I'm not going to worry about that. And so the theorem says that if you give me any large t and, and any alpha positive uh, uh, and some, some epsilon, then there exists a set of, uh, so this is the Gaussian measure. So there is no Gibbs measure, but you always have a Gaussian measure associated to the one plus alpha regularity, um, which is, that means that you're, you're forming this with the derivative to the, to the alpha square instead of, uh, instead of the gradient, you put the gradient one plus alpha square. 
and the support is here. And so there exists a set with, with measure one such that uh, you can continue this to, to a global solution and it has this form. Okay, so that's, that's the, the, the global result. And so how do we prove this? Uh, you take the data and uh, it's two steps. So in the first step, all we want is to, to, to be able to uh, show that uh, this data gives rise to, to a global uh, solution in some rougher topology. Okay? And then in the step two, we will, we will optimize the, the regularity. So the idea is that you take this data and you, you, do, you decompose it into, uh, you take some L that is going to be determined later, and you break it into N less than L, and then you take a second part where you put this like, a, if you wish, you can think of this AN as a, as a, as a high-pass high filter. Okay, so you let, you let just the, these this high frequencies pass, and that's what I call AN. And you write this as HL plus Psi 1 Omega, that's this term. And so what you know is, you know, this is just the low frequencies, then in the, in the H epsilon one, which is the regular, then this is uniformly bounded for all L. Okay, that's no, no, no problem. And, and uh, this AN Ls are, are this, as I said, this sort of like high pass filter, and uh, inside they're always less or equal than 1 over L. And so now what you do is you, you use Burgen's result in H minus epsilon to claim that there exists a set with probability 1, such that if you look at now the YL, this YL, leave this alone, take this YL, okay, and you add to that this term, okay, so this is a smoother. So the, 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 probab the, the Gibbs measure sees this with probability zero, and this is in the support of the measure, beta L is just one over L. So this is in the support of Burgen's measure, and you can add anything smooth to that because this is not seen by the measure. So this is a still in the support of the measure. And so this is one of the elements for which Burgen can, can, can continue globally. Okay, so write that as your YL plus another Psi 2. And so now you know that this evolves, by, by Burgen's result, this evolves globally to some solution UL that has this form, and you have this bounds because Burgen proved that this is always a smoother than you start. You start here, you end up here. So furthermore, actually in part of the argument, and I don't want to get into the details, what you get there is this, in this iteration argument, this approximation and this iteration argument that I mentioned before, uh, the, the, the you get as a sort of byproduct of that, you get, uh, uh, so these are just the XSB norms with epsilon and B equals to a half. So you also get these uniform uh, bounds on, on these terms in these XSB norms on each iterative time step, okay? Uniform in L. So that's part of this approximation and iteration argument of, of Burgen that I showed you before. So now uh, what you do is uh, you use this, that this is global, the UL is global, to prove the existence and uniqueness of the U alpha that you want. Okay? And, uh, and the key, the reason, that's the, that's the perturbation argument, and the reason why the perturbation argument works is because the, uh, these norms are less than 1 over L. They are small, so these terms are small. They can be made small, okay? And so what you do is, instead of solving for U alpha, you look again at a, at a, diff as a suitable difference equation, so you call zeta prime L to be uh, the linear evolution of what you want minus the solution. This is, the, this is what you want to solve, so you want to solve for that. But instead of looking at that, you look at the difference between the Burgen one and that one. That's the perturbation. That looks like this. this, this solves this problem. And this is kind of like the cubic term, and this is the cubic term. And the fact that these two things are small is what allows you to, to, to finish uh, uh, with the contraction and iteration. I mean, the two, that these two things are small plus this uniform bound allows you to prove that indeed this exists, and then the solution, the Z alpha that you're after is simply this Z prime. And so you found, you found the solution as the linear evolution of, of that data plus the uh, Z alpha. And once, yes, yes, once, no, 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 he's cheating. Yeah, yeah, he's cheating. No, 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 come on. <laughs> All right, so, um, and once you have that, the step two is the, is the, is the, is the recovery of regularity is the recovery of regularity, which actually I'm going to skip since, since now I'm being pressed. <laughs> so the second part is, is what I want to talk is, so all of this was about... Uh, 
<laughs> so I don't have this cons. So the first part is about not the cosmic censorship, or whatever. It's about the the global repugnance which you don't like. So, but that gives measures which kind of is kind of like the the the, the equilibrium ones. And so what I want to talk about quickly now is about this other result, which is actually uh, the transfer of energy. This is related to uh, the talk of, of Patrick, maybe the first day uh, for the halfway, but also to some uh, lectures that Zacher, I mean, it's kind of the other side of what Zacher was describing last week. And so this is kind of like the, the, the typical question of the transfer of energy of the out of equilibrium dynamics for NLS. And uh, so everybody knows that if you are on, on RD you, and if you have scattering, the, there is no sort of like a skate. And that on compact domains, you lose that, OK? So, so the question was how to, how, to, how to capture that. And this is what also goes by the name of with turbulence. And Burgen's approach was that what you want to do is you want to study the growth of the, of the Sobolev norms uh, to see how this uh, uh, moves. Um, uh, how this is transferred. Okay, so his, his, his uh, actually his uh, conjecture uh, in, in 2000 was whether he asked whether there exist global solutions to the cubic equations whose uh, HS norms uh, grow indefinitely. Okay, this is what is called the sort of infinite cascade conjecture. And so um, Bourguin himself did uh, some progress on that. He constructed some special um, 1D nonlinear wave equations, some modified equ equations in which he, he exhibited that. There is some work of Kuskin. And then the fundamental progress came in, in this paper of Koliander, Kils, Tafilani, Takao, Katao, in which they actually constructed large but finite growth on the Sobolev norms. And if you haven't seen that result, I, I put it here. There is also work of Hani, Gerard, and Grelier, uh, Guardia, Kalosh, and Procesi. And, uh, and more recently, actually, in, in, a, in a really nice paper of Hani, Posada, Zetkov, and Vigiglia, sort of they proved that if instead of the torus you take the, the product domain, these this, uh, cylinders, then actually they, 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 they solve the, the conjecture. Uh, they said they proved yes, and they also gave some, some rate. And on Monday, the first talk of, the, of this conference, we, we saw Patrick talking about uh, similar things for the, for the half wave on R. And so now, to understand Burgen's conjecture for the cubic analysis is actually a very, very hard, very hard, of course, very hard problem, very ambitious. And so, but something that which is kind of like in between Burgen and what I described in the first part of the talk, which is this, this, this invariant uh, Gibbs measures, is uh, really, really the, 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 the study of um, uh, the existence and uniqueness of non-equilibrium invariant measures. Okay, so this is kind of like the, the in, in stack mech, uh, it's kind of like this, uh, it's very hard and, and very poorly understood the, 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 the existence of stationary non-equilibrium states. And, and for us, this, this is trying to uh, maybe give some sort of justification, some sort of like rigorous um, sort of uh, framework for, for the statistical description of the um, sort of out of equilibrium dynamics. Now this problem is very hard and it's very hard even for stochastically forced systems. Uh, in which is, 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 actually, is actually very hard. But there has been progress uh, uh, in these sort of like uh, uh, chains of oscillators uh, of uh, Ekman, Pillet, Rayvelet, Rayvelet, Thomas, and, and more recently of Herr Mattingly, in which they look at sort of a collection of unharmonic oscillators with, with near, uh, near neighborhood coupling. So here you have uh, the Hamiltonians they consider. And uh, 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 this is in the first two papers, uh, this is the relationship between the pinning and the coupling. And this uh, is, is the much harder case in which uh, the relationship is like this. And there already, they cannot solve this problem unless they only have three oscillators. So here there is no, no, no uh, sort of problem with the end, but here they cannot do more than three. And the idea is that what you do is you take this and you put them into contact with two heat baths at different temperatures. So you have your system and what you do is you want to inject energy into the first mode and dissipate it into the last. And, and you want to try to see if whether uh, uh, the system will relax into, into a stationary uh, non-equilibrium state. And so um, for us, so, so, so for us, the starting point is actually this toy model in the work of Koliander, Klista, Filani, Tagao, Katao, whose Hamiltonian has this form. And, uh, and um, it is known of the proof there. Uh, so here, this is much harder than the other one because the interactions don't depend just on the relative distances, but also on the momenta of the particle and the neighbors. And it's known that there is a, a, a finite set uh, for which uh, uh, the resonant NLS is closed and collapses to, to this toy model, the one that has this Hamiltonian. And so we do the same thing. We attach uh, 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 two heat baths at the low mode, C1 and Cn, and, uh, which is sort of a, a standard way of, uh, of um, 
adding and dissipating energy. And what we expect is this system to, to converge to a non-equilibrium invariant measure, uh, which has some sort of flux uh, uh, from low frequencies to hard. And we also want some sort of like rate of convergence. And so that's, that's what we want to do. And so uh, the stochastic OD model looks like this uh, for that H. So this is, you see the heat baths here. Uh, and we also add these terms, that's the, the Hamiltonian. So we leave the, the middle terms, the, the middle modes alone, and we just do this. <laughs> and, uh, and so you, you look at the, so just, I wrote it just for convenience. This is the, the sort of the, 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 the generator of the, of the transition semigroup. The, the Fokker-Planck operator uh, is here. And so what you know, the first thing that you can prove is that if you are at equal temperatures of T1 is Tn, then this system indeed relaxes to uh, an invariant Gibbs measure, okay? And all, all of that follows from the fact that if you look at the adjoint of the, of a, of the operator for the plant on this, this is zero. And so what is interesting is in the non-equilibrium case, that's a sort of equilibrium, is what happened at different temperatures, okay? And you want to prove whether there exists a unique, smoother Gaulic non-equilibrium invariant measure uh, that has uh, this transfer of energy. And the answer is that again, that if you have three modes, so in other words, we only have one, two, three, so J is two, then uh, actually we can prove that. And maybe uh, to finish, because I don't want to push your patience. <laughs> what is it, Alan? 30 seconds? No, no, we still have three minutes. Oh, three minutes, perfect, wonderful. So, um, is that what I want to explain is that in the proof of this, what is hard is, is the only thing that is really hard is the existence. Okay, everything else kind of is a standard, okay? But the existence of the measure is very, very hard. So to understand this, let me show you two transparencies. First, um, first I'm going to maybe uh, show you what we can prove. So uh, and we can also uh, get some rates. And um, the problem is that we're still finishing. There is one region which is a little delicate, so we don't know if we are going to get exponential or polynomial uh, yet. So, so one, one useful thing is to change coordinates, then uh, you have to change coordinates more than once, but you can change coordinates, so this is the ij, so this is m, it's the sum of these squares, and this is the, 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 the angles. And so the first problem we have, unlike the previous works, is, is, that, is that we lose the hypoelipticity in all of phase space. So we, we are not hypoelliptic everywhere, but uh, uh, we have to remove this, okay? We have to remove, have a degenerate line, that we have to remove. The good thing is that if you start uh, with C2 equals to zero, then you will remain at C2 equals to zero. But uh, in the hypolepticity, which is what gives you that if something exists, it's going to be smooth, uh, then uh, we have now a boundary. We have this boundary. And so the existence of the measure follows from uh, what is it that you want to do? What you want to do is you want to construct a, a Lyapunov function that somehow penalizes this region where this is a small, and sort of high frequencies. And somehow uh, what you want to do is uh, uh, once you construct it, then that construction will give you an upper bound on the heating time of, of the good region, which should be a compact set. So let me show you quickly a picture because maybe that will be easier. This is, this is actually what is hard about the problem. We have to chop phase space, which, which, which they didn't have to do before. And so now it's like this is the good region where you want all your dynamics to happen. And so what you want to do is you want to prove, you want to construct Lyapunov functions uh, here that tells you that as soon as you enter any of these regions, you, you are kicked back into here, okay? But usually, you know, usually they, when these things are very hard to do and usually people, what they do is they say, well, you know, your guess, your best guess is that the Lyapunov function should be e to the m. But that doesn't work everywhere here. And you have to actually understand very well what are the dynamics of the deterministic system to, to understand uh, what works where, and in the regions in which you have more than one boundary, these boundaries are determined by the temperature and the gamma and so on, but in the regions in which you have uh, uh, these boundaries, they have contact, they, they talk to each other, uh, you can guess one and then the way to solve it, uh, the way to solve it, so you can guess one of them and then what you have to do is you have to solve sort of a, a, a Poisson equation with the right boundary values uh, and some convexity conditions and solve uh, for all the other ones, flow it, all the others to, to get them. And, and in some of the regions to get this, the problem is that you have to really understand uh, to get this, to, to you really have to understand uh, uh, how the phases, you, you, need the, you need to understand the, the phase diagram and know that the phases will lock uh, at some point. And so it's actually uh, quite delicate. 
And so, and so this is where the, 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 the heart of the matter is. And as I said, uh, once you have that, then uh, the rest, the uniqueness and the ergodicity follows from sort of a, a control uh, argument, so a controllability lemma that tells you uh, that the deterministic system uh, sort of can access any region uh, in, in phase space. So, so if you give me two points, I can find uh, uh, an epsilon, a neighborhood of, of one, so that if I start here, I end up uh, in the other one, anywhere in phase space. And then there is a standard uh, a theorem of Struck and Baradan that tells you that once you have that for the uh, deterministic system, the, 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 the stochastic one uh, will behave the same way. And uh, thank you very much. I'll leave you the picture. I spent a lot of time on that. So. Thank you. Uh, questions? Yes. So, uh, did I understand correctly that the difficulty is to understand the dynamics of this ODE in big dimension in a very precise way? Yes, and we cannot do, you see, the problem is look at this. We have to break all of this only with three modes. If you have four, for example, the problem, what is the problem? The problem is, okay, high energies, uh, you, can, you can do, but the problem is uh, at low energies, right? They are when, when you're zero. So if you are stuck in the middle, I mean, your energy doesn't move anywhere, right? I mean, if you have four modes, maybe you, you are stuck there. And, and so, you know, <laughs> we are happy first if we can do three. I mean, uh, the paper of, of Jonathan with, uh, with Martin, they are also on three. They, can, they cannot do four either. So, so it's, not, it's not clear. It will be much more complicated. The, the way in which you will have to chop and understand is the construction of this Lyapunov function is, is, is hard. But does it help if you have more conserved quantities? Um, I don't know. Um, see, the Hamiltonian is here. I don't know. I don't know. Good question. I, I don't know. Other um, questions? Thank you.